Welcome, guys. Come on in. Yay. Um, okay, so we are in John. You might as well turn your Bibles open to John because that's where we're going to be in the middle section. In the Bible. I am using the NKJV. Monday nights I'll use the um, NIV if I keep it straight in my mind. <laughs> Thanks. Very cool. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is a strengthener or a comforter. We learned about that last week to us. Just like Jesus was a strengthener or a comforter to his disciples every day, no matter what the day brought. Now, if that is true, and it is, then that means there are two precepts, which is your Roman numeral one. And it's that number one, it means that the Holy Spirit is a person. Remember that, always remember it. Never slip back into thinking that the Holy Spirit is an it or a force. Always remember he's a full personality because he thinks, he feels, he guides, he teaches, he leads, he speaks, he can be grieved, he can be angered, he can be made to feel good, and that's only things that a person can do. He is a person who can be to you all that Jesus is. And it's interesting when you look at sects or cults who claim to have truth like Jehovah's Witness or Christian Science or Mormons or Spiritism and so on. They always refer to, refer to the Holy Spirit as a kind of force or atmosphere. It's an impersonal it. And that's where they are off, okay? It just means that they don't understand what Jesus taught. And Jesus said that he would pray to the Father and that the Father would give another comforter. Let's go there, John 14, 16, just so that we can make sure we see that. Chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, that's where we'll be today for the most part. Um, 14, 16, Jesus' words. And by the way, I suggest when you when you start another section of the Bible, read John. You know, read the book of John, the Gospel of John. It's for mature believers. It will mature you. It's all about the Holy Spirit. It will really grow you. Um, but anyways, 16th verse of 14. And Jesus said, and I will, verse, verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever okay another another is your another there gold face sorry no. did you say 14 16? chapter 14 okay. verse 16 let's read it again okay. chapter 14 verse 16 and i will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever now <clears throat> is your is your version is another bold face to you no okay yeah. helpers yeah. Helpers, because that's the Holy Spirit, but another. Mm -hmm. Underline another. It should be bold-faced. Mine mm -hmm. is bold-faced. Okay, another. All right? There are two different kinds of another. Okay? These are cheap readers that I need now that I'm old. And I got a pack of these, um, 2.0s, from Amazon, right? You can just get them. All right, and it did work well, and uh, but you know, over time, because I throw them around and, and they're just cheap, cheap, cheap. You know, I need to that they break or whatever, right? So, I need to order another pair, okay? So, my thing is, if they work well, if these 2.0ers work really well and I like them, I get I go back to my order history and I buy another one of these mm -hmm. so that's another of the same mm -hmm. kind but let's say i hate them and they don't work well and when i put them on it's just like oh i mean i'm gonna go to amazon and i'm going to get another different mm -hmm. prescription yeah. or a, another type whatever right or like let's just say the pens right now that they're writing with they're writing notes with pens or pencils right and you run out of ink or it breaks, you either like it or you hate it. Mm -hmm. And if you hate it, you go, give me another pen, mm -hmm. meaning give yeah. me a different kind of pen or a pencil, right? Well, in Greek, there is two words for another. Another that is exactly the same mm -hmm. or another that is totally and completely different. And that's why it's bold-faced 
in your Bible because what it's saying is the Greek word for another there is the Greek word for exactly the same kind. The exact same kind. So let's read it again. I Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another, the exact same kind of helper that I am that he may abide with you. You're going to get me, another me. You're going to get another me, okay? That's what that means right there, okay? All right, therefore, if it's another just like Jesus, then if it's exactly like Jesus, then it has to be a person. Do you see that? And that's why we know that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's the personality, the Holy Spirit. He is exactly like Jesus. Do, do you know what that word is? Or Alos, A-L-O-O-S. And I forget the Greek word for different, but... But this is the one. That's Jesus. the one, yeah. Alos. Yes, it's Alos, okay? Oh, last week's, last week's um, outline. The, the Holy Spirit took me in a different direction last week. But it's on last week's outline, the, okay. the same and the different, okay? Oh, do you have yeah. that... Yeah. What is the difference? Yeah, yeah. Heteros and heteros. Heteros. Well, yeah, no, heteros, right? Hetero, sexual, or, right? So, or heteros is different, so we know that. But alos is the same. Okay? Okay. But that means, okay, so we have established, because Jesus said that I would send another alos just like me, then that means there's a second precept that follows, also encapsulated in your Roman numeral one. And it must be maintained then that if the Holy Spirit is another helper, just like Jesus, then that means the Holy Spirit is God. Because Jesus was God. He was God in the flesh. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is God in the flesh. So it means the Holy Spirit is a person. And it, and it means that Holy Spirit is also God. Now, let's step back in time before the cross. Okay? To the time of the cross. When Jesus was on this earth, it, he was ministering, anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was ministering for three and a half years. And it took people three and a half years to find out that that was true. That the Holy Spirit was a person. That the Holy Spirit was God, just like Jesus. But you know what? For these Jewish disciples, it was a blow away. You had one of them named Thomas, who was a skeptic. He had a very scientific brain. And he's the one who, having known Jesus for those years, said, all of a sudden he said something very profound for a Jewish boy. My Lord, meaning my master, and my God. And he said that to whom? To Jesus. Now, for a Jew to say to a person with flesh on, my Lord... That's okay, because you could be a slave, and you call your master Lord, right? That's what it means. But to say, my Lord and my God, as a Jewish boy, and I'm going to tell you something, the earth shook for those Jews. For the first time in their life, those Jews realized that God was more than one person, because now they call Jesus God, because those Jewish boys were taught very well the verse in the Old Testament, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. And that's the hardest thing today for the Jews to understand about Christians. You say that you worship our God, but you say he's three. No, he isn't. He's one. That's the, that's the great gulf. That's the huge gulf. That's where the blinders are on. God put, God put him in a sleep. And he put him partially, well, he put him in a deep sleep and he partially blinded them to that fact because they rejected Jesus. They weren't fully blinded, right? Partially blinded means that if you seek to see, you will be able to see. But that's just something that just stops them right there. They go, how, you Christians, why do you say that? The Lord, the Lord God is one. This is huge for a Jew. And all of this led to the understanding of what we call today the doctrine of the Trinity. So if the Holy Spirit is exactly like Jesus, then the Holy Spirit is also God, which means you can pray to him and you can praise him because Christians believe in Father, Son, and 
Holy Spirit, all of whom are persons, and each one can be grieved and angered, each one can be made happy, each one whom all love you and have compassion for you. So we say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, freely, and we praise all three freely. But anyways, back to the middle chapters of John. Jesus now is getting ready to die within 24 hours of his life. And what a man says on the last day of his life is usually pretty significant and memorable. And the Son of God said many, many wonderful things. In fact, it has been recorded, Scripture says, if they had all been written down, the things that Jesus had said, the world could not contain the books. That's how much he said. So we only get a small portion of it. But in these chapters, we, believe it or not, chapters 14 through 16 of John, we have the longest recorded discourse of Jesus' words in the Bible. And actually, if you take the whole of the New Testament and, and compile all of what Jesus said, You've only got about six hours worth of teaching. That's it. If you just go through it, about six hours of teaching. But here, John, the passage Jesus is teaching is longer, believe it or not, than the Sermon on the Mount. And most people think about the Sermon on the Mount as being his longest teaching. That's in Matthew. You can read about it. But no, the Sermon on the Mount is his second longest teaching. And the Sermon on the Mount is just magnificent. In fact, many people have said, if people would just live up to the words of the Sermon on the Mount, well, that's all the world would ever need. We wouldn't have the problems that we have. But here's the thing, nobody has ever been able to live out the Sermon on the Mount. That's the problem. How could we? How could we possibly live out the words Jesus called for his people to do from the Sermon on the Mount? Well, the answer to that question lies in Jesus' last sermon that he preached on the Holy Spirit. The heart of the Sermon on the Mount, basically in a nutshell, this very long sermon, it's this. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's basically the nutshell of the Sermon on the Mount. Just treat others the way you want to be treated. Sounds simple, but it isn't quite as easy walked out, right? But really, how many of us have ever given our neighbors as much attention as we wish to receive? Right. Or how many of us have given those lonely people down the road as much friendship as you would wish to have if you were all alone? How many hungry people in the world have you thought of when you were hungry? The fact is, there isn't one of us in any church who can say, well, you know what, I have basically lived out the Sermon on the Mount in full. I just have done that. Not, not one of us can say we even come close to living that out. And that's discouraging. How shall we ever get there? And the answer is we need another helper. We need another comforter, another standby to come and help us. And see, that's exactly what Jesus spoke about on the last night of his earthly life. He introduced us to the person, God, the Holy Spirit. And he said that night that God, the Holy Spirit, another helper, would take the place of himself on earth. Why? In order to fulfill the Sermon on the Mount. In order that that sermon <coughs> might take place throughout the whole earth. In order that preaching, teaching, teaching, miracles could and would continue. And it was right here that night that those Jews learned Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are identical in character. To meet one is to meet all of them. They think the same. They have the same point of view. We can see this theory ring true in marriages that have lasted many, many years. To meet one is to meet the other. That is totally my parents. They have the same reactions to particular circumstances. And, you know, are they different? Yeah, for sure they're different. And, and, and they have different talents and different points of view. But I'm going to tell you, basically, all my brothers and myself, we could tell you that, oh, yeah, no, this is how they, they feel, you know, this is, the, this is their point of view from that. This is their point of view from that. This is their point of view. I mean, it's just doom, 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 right down the line. Well, that's true of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you know the Father, well, then you get to know 
the son and vice versa. If you get to know the son, well, then if you know Jesus, then who do you know? You know the father. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen who? The father. If you see me, then you know what the father is like. To see one is to see the other. God the son, what he did is he just put flesh on and he came down to earth in order to reflect the father. Right? How are we going to... So how are we going to, as people who are tied to the earth with gravity, ever know what holiness is? How are we going to understand the hallways of eternity? There's no way we could, and God knew that. He tied us to the earth with gravity. So what did he do? He said, son, will you go to earth? Will you put flesh on and reflect me? And then will you pay the price and redeem them? And what did the son say? Mm -hmm. I guess I will. And the Holy Spirit says, I'll bear him up. In order to do it. To what? To be crucified? No. To take the wrath of God all by himself. Every bit of wrath against all sin, past, present, and future. Wow. He would need bearing up. Right? And so they all entered into that eternal covenant together. You see? So... It's just as true of the Holy Spirit. If you get to know the Holy Spirit, then you will get to know Jesus better. And you will also get to know God the Father better because they're all alike. They all speak alike. And they all have the same feelings toward you. If one of them is grieved by something you have done, the other two are grieved by that same thing. If one of them is happy with something you have done, the other two feel exactly the same way. If one tells you to do something, the other two will be in total agreement that that's the thing that you need to do. Do you see that? And so we believers are called to reflect Jesus in the world. All right? And so in John chapter 17, we have the words that Jesus prayed. And at the very end of his prayer Jesus said father I am in you and you are in me I just say the things you want me to say I just do your will we are one do you realize what that means every time Jesus opened his mouth he only spoke in prophecy because he only said what God the father wanted him to say can you imagine that every word that comes out of your mouth is prophetic all the time that's what it was like that's what it was like why was it because he was god in the flesh it's because he was god in the flesh filled with that's right how could he know what god was saying if he had allowed himself to be tied to earth how would he know what God the Father was saying? How would he know that? He had to find out from whom? God the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? <coughs> and that's the situation that we're in. It's such closeness. It's beautiful. I don't think any relationship on earth could be as close, and it can't because the Holy Spirit wants to be in you. You can't get another person to live inside you. You can't, but you can with the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, and Spirit are so united. They're so identical in character, in outlook, thoughts, and feelings. But I want to affirm that they each have a different work to do. They do not, they do not have identical work. They have identical outlooks and feelings and thinking. But they don't have identical work. But they do have an identical purpose or a goal or an end goal. And each of them gets on with that work in his own way. But they do it with perfect unity. They have the same purpose. Again, we can see that in a marriage, right? You can be equally yoked. You can be a husband and a wife <coughs> in unity in your thoughts and in your purpose of pleasing God the Father, right? That's the end goal. And we're going to raise our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. That the same goal, the same thinking. That behavior is wrong. That behavior is right. Everything is the right. Exactly the same. Identical. And yet have different work where a husband can get up and go to work to earn money and be a sole provider while 
a wife stays home and takes care of the kids, right? It's the same end goal, but different work. And that's what it is. And so what we have in chapters 14 through 16, Jesus explains three aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk and full because that's what we're on. We're in a series about the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at his three aspects of his work. The Holy Spirit has work each and every day. First, his work in relation or relative to Jesus. Second, his in relativity to his disciples. And third, to the world. These are the three aspects of God, the third person of the Trinity in his work. So let's look at number one, his work in relation to Jesus. Now, here's what he does. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings Jesus to people's attention. Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, the spirit of truth, that's what he's called, the Holy Spirit sometimes called and referred to as the spirit of truth. Jesus said, he will glorify me. He will glorify Jesus, which means that the Holy Spirit will take my things and he'll make them real to you. That's what Jesus was saying. He will make people think about me, Jesus. The Holy Spirit will get people talking about Jesus. He draws their attention to Jesus. That's what he's always doing inside a believer. Jesus, 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 Jesus,
Oh, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I went to this conference about the Holy Spirit. You know, that, no, that's the clue right there. Now, there is a place and a time to sit and learn and study the work of the Holy Spirit, to learn how to think about him correctly and learn about what his job is. A place like this, where we get together and learn the distinction. But when the spirit of truth comes within, if you're following him, I'm gonna tell you what he's always gonna be pointing to. Jesus, you did this through me today. Jesus, will you work in me today? It's always about Jesus. That's what it is. Man, do you realize how many churches have been split up, divided over the controversy of the Holy Spirit? I've seen it in my whole life. And in many of those causes, or in those cases, the talk that has caused the division is all about who? The Holy Spirit and his gifts. The Holy Spirit. And well, I think the Holy Spirit. And I think mean the Holy Spirit. The, the, rather than Jesus. Listen, that's the problem. That's the problem. The Holy Spirit will always get you focused on Jesus, not about the spiritual gifts, not about the resources of heaven that he provides to you in certain circumstances and how you need to be doing that more, this more. We need to be seeing, no, that's not what he does. He causes people to talk about and point others to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And that is why the Holy Spirit was given to you, to have an anointing, a powerful anointing on your lips to tell other people about Jesus and what pleases him and what doesn't. <coughs> You've got to remember, the Holy Spirit is the most self-espacing person of the Trinity. He doesn't want you to talk about him. He wants you to talk to people about Jesus. Jesus. That's the first work of the Holy Spirit. Now let's, after what I just said, let's read that in Scripture to verify what I just said. Okay? Let's go to John chapter 15, verse 26. And this is Jesus' words, okay? And he says this, But when the Helper comes, who's the Helper? Mm -hmm. Whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. me. Who's the me? Jesus. Jesus. See, that's what his work is. You don't need to be talking about the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he will get, and be open to his gifts and, and ex accept all the resources of heaven that he will give you. But it's for the purpose of talking to the world or loved ones or believers within the kingdom of God about magnifying Jesus, glorifying Jesus, making Jesus. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's make Jesus larger. That's what we're to do. Too much of worship today is focused on people, me. Lord, you do this for me, and I need this from you. And we got to flip the narrative. That's not anointed worship. Whether it's in lyrics or whether it's in speaking. Listen, it's all about who? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, you might feel this way and that way. And you can read about it in the Psalms when the psalmist would write, this is happening and that, but they always turn it around and say, but Lord, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the focus. He knows what you're going through. He's purchased you. He knows your needs. Let's just glorify him. Let's just magnify him in this situation. That's the key. You see that? Or let's turn to chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. You know, Jesus' words again. It's that long sermon. And he says this in 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. See, you're taken care of. He will glorify me, Jesus. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Do you see that? It's just so clear. The work 
of the Holy Spirit. So let's look now at number two, his work in relation to disciples, okay, meaning us. The Holy Spirit is more concerned with our mind than with our heart. Say that. He's more concerned with your mind than with your heart. Say it again. <clears throat> He's more concerned with our mind than our heart. Yeah, my mind and our heart. He really is concerned about what you think. Does it mean he doesn't care what you feel? No, I'm not saying that. He just cares a whole lot more how you think. And that's what he's going to focus. He's more concerned with our thoughts than our feelings. That's where he's going to get you. So you... The feelings just are second place. But over and over, I run into people who think that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is primarily a, just a commotional, ecstatic experience, giving me wonderful bubbly. I just need more of the Holy Spirit. I just need to feel the bubbly feelings. Right? Now, it's not to say that you won't feel those feelings, right? And it's, it's not wrong. Those feelings aren't wrong. But listen, Jesus never promised that. And it should not worry you if those feelings do not come. Or, in fact, if you have bad feelings. The Holy Spirit is concerned with his disciples thinking right. And if it means that you got to go through bad feelings to think right, mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Yeah. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. Rather than feeling right. You can't trust your feelings. And that's why Jesus took so much time teaching them in order to set their mind straight in how they would think. Let's go to John 15, verse 18. 15, verse 18. So here's some correct thinking, and it really, really is contrasted or compared, however you want to say it, with our feelings, okay? So Jesus gave us a heads up. Thank you, Lord, for this heads up. And this is what he said in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Got it? Okay. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world, and therefore, the result is, the world what? Hates you. Hates you. Oh, okay, thanks for the warning. <laughs> Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. So if they persecuted me, and I'm your master, mm -hmm. they will also persecute you. you. And if they kept my word, they mm -hmm. will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin at all. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Why did he say that? Because Jesus always confronted them about no. sin. He wasn't afraid to confront them. He, there wasn't yeah. unconditional mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. He was always starting a conflict, right? But it wasn't for the purpose of being argumentative. That wasn't his problem. Mm -hmm. He was going after sin. Mm -hmm. Oh, go get your husband. Oh, I don't really have a husband. Yeah. And the guy you're living. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. All right, keep going. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. They hated Jesus. They hated Jesus. Listen, you can't be a follower of Jesus and want the world to love you. It's a contradiction. So how holy are you? How much do you belong to Jesus? Well, there's a meter measure. You could measure how much you belong to Jesus. How hated are you? That's the meter. That is the meter. Are you really hated? Are you really hated? Or are you are you really kind of doing it different than Jesus did? We're just going to kind of be relational to the world. 
Yeah, our church is called Relative. We're Relative. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, and it's okay, you know, we're just so loved, and uh, mm -hmm. Jesus did. Listen, we're both hating me, and they're going to hate you if you belong to me. Hate you. Hate means rejection. Total rejection. That's what mm -hmm. hate means. How rejected are you? Mm -hmm. It's a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. well, if you aren't totally hated, well, you're not having many badges. Does that mean you're going to go out and just try to get people to hate you? Of course not. What you're going to go out is you're going to speak truth. Truth. That's what it is. Okay? That's how Jesus ends his sermon, by the way. <laughs> he ends it with that. Right? His teaching. He was teaching them how to think. See, he's more concerned about their thoughts than their feelings. Oh, they're going to hate you. But that hurts my feelings. Yeah, but they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you. They hated me. They're going to hate you. Expect it. I want, to, I want to set your thinking straight now. They're going to hate you. See? Jesus, Jesus. Ah! It's a badge of honor. Praise you, Jesus. See, that's it. Now, that's easier said than done, obviously. We're in a safe spot here, but we go out there, and that is what it is. See? And so, it's such an important concept, especially in today's society. And what I'm talking about is in America, in America's church. Because that's not what we're being really implied, what we're being taught to do through implication. You just got to show unconditional love. No, you don't. And, and therefore, all the emphasis of your testimony of Jesus now has been put on feelings. It's an overflow of existentialism. Or it's, it's metaphysical, and that's what narcissism does. It puts a narcissist self love mm -hmm. puts all the emphasis on don't offend me, you can't do that to me, and I think and it acts like it's all really sensitive and really easily hurt. Oh, let me tell you something: it is steel and it is unwilling to bend. Is what it is actually. Sadly, this emphasis on feelings has flowed right into the church today. That is what we're dealing with, and that's why I teach like I do. That God just wants you happy. He wants you to just love people unconditionally. And that holiness thing, yeah, that'll happen later when we're with him. Don't worry about the holiness part. What are the two things that believers need? Forgiveness of sins. Without which we will not see the Lord. Yeah. So it's false prophecy, these kind of messages from the mouth of a deceiver. Don't listen to them. And this concept of how believers are to think comes out again and again through chapters 14 through 16. Jesus described the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth, not the spirit of feelings. The spirit of truth. Truth is what your mind understands. Truth is what you think about. Truth is what is real. In fact, in the Greek language, did you know that reality, the word reality, is truth? It's what is real. It's what is true and right. By the way, truth doesn't change based on feelings. It just doesn't. Truth doesn't vacillate. According to circumstances, well, you know, in this case, because, you know, no, mm -mm. truth remains. It's a plumb line. You can count on it. It's consistent. What do you do when you're hanging pictures? You go out and you get your tools, and what do you get? You get that, what is that? Leveler. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, leveler with the bubble. Yeah. You know? The bubbler. It's always there. We we're looking at the bubble because you trust the, where's the bubble? Here's just get, well, more. We'll get the bubble right there. Yeah. Oh, there right. Oh, 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 and we're just so, so concerned with the darn bubble. <laughs> the bubble, the bubble. But do we treat the Bible like that? No. Oh my gosh, what does the Bible say? Well, no, you see, where's the bubble? Go find the bubble. I see no concern about the bubble. But oh my gosh, get a picture and hang it. <laughs> Right? So the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth because when he comes to someone, they see and they understand what is true and right, no matter how it feels. One time, I couldn't believe it. You know, my father, he got about, I don't know, 17 years ago. He was 93 today. He's such good health and he's got his mind. But I think it was about, you know, whatever, you can do the math, but he was 76 years old and he got shot. He was a bus driver, it was road rage. He got shot in the chest, and the bullet went all around, all the important arteries and heart, and then he got shot right here, and the, and the shrapnel just went everywhere. And it was just, you know, he should have been dead, of course, you know. But one of the consequences that he has 
head that lives with since healing up and going through all the surgeries and everything is vertigo because it messed up with the equilibrium on the inner ear and stuff like that. And so he's had quite a few bouts with vertigo, unfortunately, and I've never had it. And then about eight years ago, I remember it was four months before my daughter got married, I woke up one morning and I sat up in bed and all of a sudden I was like, and my brain felt like it was spinning so fast. And it was vertigo. I never experienced it. And I was like, wait, what is that? It was a horrible feeling. And I was just like, no, no, just, I'm just, put, what is that? No, stop. And I was just mad. And I got up out of my bed kind of fast to just defy it, if you will. And you know what it did? It slammed me right on the floor. I could not stand up. It was so bad and it, I ended up throwing up and everything. And and the world, the, 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 the brain is not actually spinning, but it feels like it's spinning mm -hmm. in your skull. And I remember holding my head like, Scott, I mean, the closing your eyes didn't stop it opening. It was the most horrible feeling ever. I couldn't get rid of it. And what had happened is I had a sinus infection and it settled in my inner ear and, it, and I got a vertigo. And, I've heard that once you get it, you can have a little bit of a proclivity of getting that there. And I've had some little bit of bouts of it every once in a while, you know, and it's the worst feeling ever. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. The world that you're walking out into has vertigo. They just don't know it. Okay. They think that they are stable. They think that they're, their truth, which they call truth, they think that it is stable, but it's constantly changing and it's producing no stability. Their, quote, logic is not logic at all, much less their knowledge of revelation, because it's all feelings-based. That is what we're dealing with, a world that is acting upon how they feel. I was, I was certain that my brain was spinning inside my skull, but was it? In actuality, no, it wasn't, but it, felt like that, right? And so that's nothing new is under the sun. Today, our, the days are just like Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. But listen, the Holy Spirit-filled believer will not spin like that. He won't fall over. He stands secure in what is true and real, despite all the spinning that's going on around him, the crises that are happening, that are going on. Why? Because for the Holy Spirit believer, he thinks. And what does the Holy Spirit come back and tell that believer in the midst of crisis when everything is spinning out of control around him? He says, on Jesus Christ, the solid rock, you stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You stand. You stand. And then he helps you like I showed with Ginger last week. He just, he just puts something in your back right through your um, spine and you're stable and you're standing and everything around you is woo, going crazy. Mm -hmm. No, no, this is how I think. Mm -hmm. I'm Christ, the solid rock I stand. The world that you live in, that I live in, is packed with lies, packed with lies and spins. And those spins, guess what? They sound strong. They may be dressed up in strong statements spoken by seemingly strong people, men or women, right? Or the devil, but I'm here to tell you, they are lies. Lies about God, lies about men, lies about the world where we live, lies about the past, lies about the future, which presents to that person a totally false presence, or a present, a false present. Listen, where do we live? We live in him. In Romans it says, in him, or in Acts I guess it is, in him we live and we move and we have our being where in him and he's stable he's a rock and that's where we live we live in him he's in us we are in him and that's how we live and there's a lie that has been propagated that oh god won't punish sin that's not true that is a lie but here's the comfort the spirit of truth when he comes to a believer he will only bring truth and the believer knows that God must punish sinners. He must punish sin. Where is sin found? It's only found in sinners. 
it's going to get punished. But we can also know that God pardons sinners, that he is a God of mercy as well as a God of justice, right? A believer will know the truth about himself, and there are not many of us who like that, to be able to know what you are really like in God's sight. That's a devastating thing. But now, because of his pardon, we're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Right? Yeah. See, the ancient Greeks, you know what they said? To know yourself is the beginning of wisdom. To really know who you are is the beginning of wisdom. And that's what's being basically properly. You do your best self. Just know yourself. You just got to be true to yourself. First. Just be true to yourself. Know yourself, and that's where you're going to find stability. That's where you. That's what. That's a lie, right? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Not to know yourself is the beginning of wisdom. And so we live in a world packed with lies. But the Spirit of Truth, He comes along, and He will tell you what is true, and He will bring you into all truth. See, when Jesus was on earth, he could only introduce his disciples to a little bit of the truth. There were just some things they just could not understand at that particular time. Things that they just couldn't yet quite believe. They just didn't see it yet. Go to John 16. John chapter 16, verse 12. Jesus must have felt a little bit frustrated, but he also knew. He understood. Chapter 16, verse 12. Jesus says to his disciples at that time, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Why did Jesus say you cannot bear them now? They just couldn't handle any more weight of truth. They couldn't comprehend it. It would be like asking your 11-month-old to carry her big suitcase that she's going to take on her trip to Rome, or even your 4-year-old. The four-year-old can't lift up that heavy suitcase, right? You wouldn't do that to a four-year-old. You're in charge of my suitcase. It's too much weight for them. They just can't do it. And that's what Jesus says. There are things I can guarantee you in each one of our lives that the Lord wants to, the Lord, uh, God wants to put his finger on in our life and say, I'd like to start dealing with you, this issue. But you're not there yet. That's why we're still here. You can't bear it quite yet. You're just not there yet. But he's going to get to it. You see what I mean? So that was is what, what was going on. But then look in verse 14. Well, I'll just go through 14. Then verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. There's the future. 14. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. At that point in time, the, the, the disciples are just barely understanding that Jesus is God, much less they understood the Spirit of God better than the Son of God. A Jew, you can talk to the Jew about the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is all throughout the Old Testament. The Spirit of God, the Ruach of God, the Ruach of God. They understand that, but they think of it in terms of a force. But they understand and they can deal with the Spirit of God better than they can with God in the flesh, Jesus, right? Well, these Jews at this point, they were still coming into the understanding, really, that because Jesus had to be crucified yet. It was after Jesus was raised from the dead that Thomas said, my Lord and my God. So at that point in time, now God, the Godhead, has become God the Father, God the Son. They're still thinking about the Spirit as a force. But Jesus had told them, he will come and he will guide you. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and they went, ding, he's a person. He, the Holy Spirit, is a person. See, and that's what they just weren't quite up to yet. And the Holy Spirit will reveal things to us as we need to know them, okay? And so there was more that Jesus wanted to be able to tell his disciples, but they just couldn't take it in. But he said, but it's okay, because the spirit of truth is coming. And when he comes, he will lead you into all truth. And that's how he's working in my life and in your life. Truth about the past. Let's go to verse 14. I mean, chapter 14. Excuse me. Chapter 14, verse 25 and 26. Chapter 14. Okay. 
These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. He's even going to remember and help you remember. Right? That's so wonderful because as you get older, you will find this out. It's harder to memorize, isn't it? It's hard to remember things, right? Memory gets harder. He knows that we break down. Well, I'm just not going to be effective. I can't go out there because I'm, I can't depend on my memory and I'll have nothing else. And Jesus even has that covered. He says, don't worry because the Holy Spirit will... Bring it back to what your your mind of what you're supposed to say. And that's what you do. When you take a step of faith and you start speaking in a situation, you you can all of a sudden you're gonna have this thought and it's gonna pop and you're gonna go, Oh, so you know who did that? Mm -hmm. Who did that? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave you the thought. And all of those thoughts are the testimony of Jesus. Revelation tells us that prophecy, the spirit of prophecy, is the testimony of, not the Holy Spirit, the testimony of Jesus. It's going to be truth for that moment is what it's going to be. Okay? And so now he would bring everything to a person of what Jesus said in the past, which is truth for the present and about the future. How do we know how the world is going to end? Well, he gave us revelation. John received revelation through the Spirit. Okay? How do we know about the future? Do we consult horoscopes? No. no. Do we go and do a crystal ball? No. no. Do we put our trust in political pundits? No. The answer is that the Spirit of truth shows us everything. That's what we have. And it was the Holy Spirit who did this. In the Bible, we have an account of the future. Everything that you need to know about the end of this world and the beginning of the new one. Yeah, but in that, I read Revelation. I just don't totally understand all of it. You understand what you need to for the present. And as we get closer and closer to the end, if indeed we are that last generation, here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to open up Scripture and we're going to go, Oh! That's what that means. And that's what happened when the disciples, the 120, were anointed with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. All of a sudden, all the Old Testament scriptures, right? They were just like an enigma, like, well, I can't figure this out. What is this supposed to be? And that's what it says in the Bible. That It, it says that the prophets were used. Before Jesus came, there were all these prophets, right, that were speaking the message through the spirit of prophecy. Right? And they were speaking messages, but the messages were just these pieces and parts. Little piece to this guy and a little piece to that guy. And it was like a big box of puzzle pieces. There's your puzzle piece. There's your puzzle. Now put it together, but there's no picture on the box. You can't. And that's what they tried to do. And, and, and God told Daniel, it's not for you and your age. This is for a future age. You don't get to know. Just write down what I told you. And the Holy Spirit comes after the after Jesus ascends, right? Well, first of all, a lot of the picture got put together. All of these pieces put together was a picture of Jesus doing his ministry for three and a half years before and on the cross and in the grave. And he has risen and ascended back. And then the Holy Spirit came down. That's all the pieces of that. And they just couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. We don't have a picture on the box. Would you go to Walmart? Okay, there's going to be big rain this weekend. i got to have something for my kids to do. I'm going to go buy a puzzle. We're going to put a puzzle together. That'll be fun. And I'll make a big old, you know, pot of taco soup and brownies. How fun. Let's make a puzzle together. But there's no picture on the front. There would be no motivation whatsoever to put that puzzle together. Right? There was motivation because the prophets couldn't believe the pieces and the little bits of information that they were getting. Like, how can this possibly be? Well, that's what Revelation is to us right now. It's a, a lot of pieces of information, some we understand because of the 2,000 years since it's been written. And some of it's an enigma. It's like, wait, how is that going to work? How is that going to work? Well, as we get closer to the time, Holy Spirit's going to open it up to us. And we're going to be ready for it because we've saturated ourselves with the Word of God. Don't worry about it. Just read it. Mm -hmm. It's for their future. Just mm -hmm. know. It'll prepare you. 
I see now how that's going to happen. You see? And that's what all this is, all the work of the Holy Spirit. All of this. So, you know, think about it. We've got to walk in daily life now, right? Take the New Testament. You've got three major pieces or three major portions of the book. Here's the book. Okay? And we'll just say this is Old Testament, and we'll just say this is New Testament. There are three main parts of the New Testament. Okay? You've got the Gospels, which is past G for Gospel. It's past truth. It's past truth. And the Holy Spirit's going to bring that to remembrance to help you to know about the truth of what happened in the past. Then there are, the next section is the epistles. I'm just going to put E for the epistles. And what is that? That's present truth for how you live right now. That lays out your behavior. It helps us to know what is our behavior as children of the kingdom of heaven here on earth, the here and the now. Okay? And then the last portion of the New Testament is the last book. It's Revelation, and that is future truth. You got it all that you need. You got past, you got present, and you got future. The future truth, everything that you need to prepare for all that's going to take place. And even if it doesn't take place in your lifetime, you can get that next generation prepared so that they can just keep passing it on. And that's what's been happening in the true church all these years because Revelation was given 2,000 years ago. Do you see that? And you just, you prepare in case. The Lord says, occupy until you come. Occupy. That is a verb. What is the noun form of occupy? Occupation. Do your job. Do your job. Just keep doing your job until I come. Well, you see, the New Testament takes care of how we think, how we act, and what's ahead of us. That's what it is. How we think, how we act now, and what's ahead of us. And the spirit of truth brought the Bible into being. It's not the production of a bunch of men who thought that they would write down their thoughts and feelings. It's the production of the Holy <laughs> Spirit, and the whole thing is truth. So the Holy Spirit is another comforter, another strengthener like Jesus. So therefore, you would expect him to be a great teacher because Jesus was a great teacher, and he is. And if you ever find anything difficult to understand in the Word, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Every time I take my Bible and read it, I just say, Holy Spirit, you wrote this. Now, as I read it, would you teach it to me and help me to be able to teach it to others? Right? There are people that hear a sermon and come out and go, oh, I just didn't get one thing out of that. And another person comes out of the same sermon and just says, wow, I really learned something that I never knew before. Why does that happen? Because one has the Holy Spirit and the other one doesn't. The Holy Spirit's the teacher. One has a teacher in his heart who's able to take that word that the preacher's reading and speaking about. And all of a sudden something gets planted deep in the soil of his heart and it begins to germinate. And something begins to happen. Something begins to grow. And the end result is a very practical, visible thing. It's beautiful in this natural world. And then finally, good, we got time. Finally, the Holy Spirit's work in relation to the world. What can the Holy Spirit do for people outside the body of Christ? Well, now we're getting into tricky territory because look at John 14, verse 16. And this is something you must remember. So we're talking about, ah, oh, the Holy Spirit's got work to do with the world. Work to do with the world. Work to do with the world. Okay. Holy Spirit's work in the world. He works in the it's work with Jesus, it's work with believers, but then holy or uh, but then verse 16. Wait, is it 14, 16? Mm -hmm. 17. Sorry, verse 17. The spirit of truth, whom the world what? cannot receive. Uh-oh. The world can't have truth because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he does. So how in the world can the Holy Spirit have a work? with the world if the world cannot receive Holy Spirit. Listen, you got to remember that. That's a categorical statement. The world cannot have who? Holy Spirit. We just read it. 
That's truth. The world can't have it. So what in the world can the Holy Spirit do for the world? What can he do? Because they can't have him. They can't be indwelt by him. They don't get to have this strengthener or comforter or advocate. They don't get to have a fortress experience. That some This person holds them up in a bad situation. So the tragedy is that when these people come to a crisis and they find themselves in the heat of a battle, they got to face it all alone. To live without the Holy Spirit, especially in the midst of the battle, will draw out of the redeemed compassion and pity. So what in the world can the Holy Spirit do for the world? We'll go to John 16, 8. Jesus said the Holy Spirit, or the, the world can't have him. The world can't have him. He, he doesn't get he doesn't, they don't get them. They rejected me. They don't get the Holy Spirit. They don't. Oh, but there's a remedy. Verse 8. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will, what? Convict. Who? The world. The world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So he does have a work in the world. He gets to do this on the world. Uh, that's, that makes him feel horrible. That's the work of the Holy Spirit on the world. You see that? Isn't that amazing? The world can't have him yet. He still has a work in the world. So um, I just want to see if I'm understanding this. If somebody is an unbeliever, the Holy Spirit is blowing on them. What? What's he blowing? What kind conviction. of breath? The breath of the conviction. conviction. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so because I'm always praying for um, unbelievers, for the Holy Spirit to open their eyes, but if they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, right, they can't have that. But you can pray can. that the Holy Spirit would breathe His breath of conviction on them. What do, What's the greatest need of an unbeliever? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins, and of course, of holiness. But really, let's just say that <clears throat> there's been a worldly person who said, no thanks, right? Let's just mm -hmm. say there are plenty of those, yeah. right? That means that they're going to have to face what? The wrath of God. Now, we know what Jesus' reaction was to facing the wrath of God. He sweat great drops of blood. And if you read Revelations, it says that people will cry out for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the face of God. Remember that story I told you last week with Megan and mm -hmm. that friend dying? Mm -hmm. And just, ah! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sheer terror. Sheer terror. Okay? What we want then is we want them to somehow realize that terror before they actually mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. Holy Spirit, will you breathe on them a compare and contrast? That's always, I think as a teacher, I always think that that brings the light. I'm always as a teacher looking for lights to come on in eyes. You know, it's a, yeah. like I get it, ah! You know, and I find mm -hmm. that one of the methods that does that really well is compare and contrast. And that is just what we read that the Holy Spirit does. That he will convict the world of sin <clears throat> and of Righteous. That's the very opposite of sin, is righteousness. What a compare and contrast. Now I've set up the compare and contrast, right? There is sin, there is righteousness, and then what else does it do? Oh, yeah, and guess what? God's wrath is coming. Mm -hmm. See, and what have we done? Oh, mm -hmm. I just need to be loved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not what the Holy Spirit does, and that's why you can't anoint it. Mm -hmm. It's not. Go get your husband. Can you give me a drink? Go get your husband. Wow. Let's talk about something else. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. He was working in her, and she became the evangelist for Samaria. Mm -hmm. That's how he does it. So pray the Holy Spirit will breathe on them. That's right. This very verse. This very verse. Mm -hmm. John 16, 8. Word. And you know it's what? The Holy Spirit might use your lips mm -hmm. to bring about truth in their lives. Mm -hmm. We're to stir people, unbelievers, we are to stir the world up to understand that, you mean you're ready to face God? Well, let me keep going, and, and you'll understand it, okay? Mm -hmm. There are three things that are true, which you will never be able to convince anyone else 
is true without the Holy Spirit. And the three things are sin, righteousness, and judgment. You can't do it. Only the Holy Spirit can, can convince someone of that. Let's break it down. Let's talk about sin. Okay? You can easily convince people in the world. Now I'm talking about the world now. I'm talking totally about unbelievers at this point. Okay? You can easily convince people, okay, in the world of vice and of crime. Vice is an offense against oneself. That's what mm -hmm. vice is. And crime is an offense against others. You can talk to the unredeemed about the problem the world has with vices. And they are convinced about that from their own observations. They will agree with you. They are not blind to vices or addictions in this world. They are not blind to the kingdom of darkness. They are blind to the kingdom of heaven. They understand the kingdom of darkness. And something else you can very easily do is talk to the unredeemed about crime. And they will agree with you. They themselves have broken a law. Or else they know of someone who has. Again, they're just not blind to the fact that there are crimes against humanity. That's part of the world that we live in. You won't have a problem with that. And you can speak with the world of these problems and they will agree with you wholeheartedly and they won't hate you. And they would also even say to you, yes, we would like to see all vices and all crimes wiped out. They, they, we want peace. They will have no problem with that. But try and convince people of sin, impossible. Man by nature is sinful. That's impossible to convince the world. They look at that brand new baby and the only thing they see is innocence. A believer looks at that baby and he sees a lost and sinful person who is in great need of a savior. Right? Mm -hmm. And you can actually find people that live in this world that actually really don't seem to have any vices and have never committed a crime in their life. My former neighbor was like this. He's got a great reputation in L.A. Fire. He was the nicest guy in the world. He probably the most jesus-like person walking around right that you ever met right but he didn't think he needed jesus they just don't realize that they're sinners they're completely blind to the fact that they are they're respectable maybe good living decent hard-working people kind of kinder than you yet they are sinners in god's sight why because the very worst, most vile sin in the whole entire universe is not murder or adultery or, or, or any of those things, right? It is, rejecting Jesus. thank you, rejecting the gift, the greatest gift ever given to man by his creator. The greatest sin in the world is to say, no, thank you, Jesus, I don't want you, the only begotten Son of God. To throw back into God's face his love and say, God, I really don't care. I don't care that you sent your son to die and be raised for me. No, thank you. I can actually manage without him. I don't need him. I'm a good person. That is the most vile sin ever. Right there. That's it. That's the greatest sin. And that's why people are not convinced of sin, but are convinced of vice and crime. Because they believe they are good and not bad by nature. And that's the spin that we're all born into. That's the problem. People compare themselves to others and they look pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. You can always find someone worse than yourself and go, well, I'm not that bad. See, think about the millions in just our country that have heard about what Jesus has done for them. And yet we have dismissed him. And we choose not to believe in him and reject the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And you nor anyone else will ever be able to convince anybody that that is a sin. And that's why Franklin Graham or any other Christian can get on the TV, make a commercial, and offer the greatest gift ever given to man. And people will just choose to, oh yeah, turn the channel. That's it. That's it. The neighbors that are so sweet, it's hard to convince yourself at times that they are sinners because they're so kind and thoughtful. But only the Holy Spirit can convict that nice neighbor that he is a sinner and in need of a Savior. And so sin is the first thing a person needs to be convinced of if they're not going 
if, if they're going to come to a Savior, their sin, their own sin, and that's the breath of the Holy Spirit convicting. It's not heaven that a person needs to be convinced of first. It's not eternal life that they need to be convinced of first. It's not the love of God which they need to be convinced of first. It is sin. The gospel is bad news before good news. It's not a gospel if there isn't bad news. If it's good news, it has to be contrasted with something that is contrary. Sin and sin only must be the very first thing addressed in an unredeemed person. And today's evangelism has taken the sin factor out of the mix. Oh, the unconditional love of God. That's just how he deals with you. It takes away any sting of sin. Don't ever say that. If you don't believe that you're a sinner, you will never need a savior. If you think you don't have sins or that Jesus is okay with them, you won't come to Jesus. And it's the Holy Spirit's work that is doing this to blow on people, to blow his breath of conviction on sin. Okay? Not of crime, not of vice, not of bad habits, sin. And he is able to do that with people. Battling vices and battling crimes, as well as people who do neither and consider themselves good. How does he do that? Well, the Romans, Book of Romans says he does it either by the word of God, by nature, or by one's conscience. But listen, there comes a partnership with the spirit-filled believer. He plants believers all over the world. He plants them right in the middle of trouble, and he comforts us, and then he says, now you be a bright light. And that light will act as convicting. That's why. You, you've been given a house by the Lord, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. You've been put right in a neighborhood that needs it. You're going to live a life that in and of itself will convict. See, that's what it does. And we can read the history of God's people persecuted, even tortured for the sake of the lost, in order that the Holy Spirit might do the work. Do you realize that somebody right now, a brother and sister in Christ, right now is being tortured mercilessly? And that person is being allowed to be tortured mercilessly by his father in heaven in order to be a light in a dark, dark, dark place. That while that torturer is torturing every, every whack, he's feeling it. Every single whack because the Lord wants that person. He will even use us in that situation. That's what it is. You don't necessarily pray for the persecuted brother and sister in Christ to get out of persecution, you pray that their testimony is right. Oh, Lord, Holy Spirit, gird them up in it. Give them a, a, a picture and a vision that is supernatural of what is happening, what's taking place. And may the word of God go forth and may those wounds being inflicted, may they boomerang back in conviction of mm -hmm. the torturer and may he repent. Mm -hmm. That's the picture. Okay, and righteousness. Now the unredeemed need to be convinced of righteousness. There is such a thing as perfect goodness. And it's in a someone who is perfect. And the man came, he lived on earth, he died for your sins, he faced the wrath of God, and he went back to heaven and he still lives. There's a righteousness. And you know what? He, he doesn't just want to take your sins away from you. He wants to say, here, now put this on every day. You can be Righteous. Just clothe yourself in me every day. And that's what we do. Oh, Lord, would you cleanse me of my sin of omission and commission? And wash me, Lord, in the water of your word. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit. May I just be clothed in Jesus. Because I know who name that is. But I just want to be, I just want to be clothed in your righteousness. Yes, I'll do that. Here, take this. That's what it is. That's the second thing he does. And then the last thing, judgment. Have you ever tried to convince a person that one day they will stand before God and they will have to answer for every idle word that they've ever uttered, every thought that they've ever had, for every feeling passed through their minds for their whole entire life, and that in that judgment, everything will be, even the things they forgot will be brought up again? See, people today don't believe that judgment is coming. Judging is bad. Oh, that's bad. You're not a good Christian. You're judging. You're judging. And people today are not believing in hell. Or they just said, we'll party together in hell. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Listen, the answer is the Holy Spirit will convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what John the Baptist said. He goes, how are you going to escape God's coming wrath? And he said that to the church of the Old Testament. He said that to the leaders of Judaism before the new covenant was established. He talked to the church about that. 
the coming wrath of God. We pray that people will understand it. Now, Jesus didn't tell us to go out and to preach hell, fire, and brimstone. All of Jesus' messages on hell were to believers, and that's where we do need to speak about hell because there is no longer a fear of God inside the church. Mm -hmm. So that does need to be spoken to believers. But I don't say go out to unbelievers and say, you're going to hell. I'm not saying that. I am saying ask the Holy Spirit for how he's going to speak to you. Ask questions. He will give you the right question to ask that person to help the comparing and the contrasting. And one day they will realize they've been convinced there is sin. I'm actually much worse than I thought. And Jesus is actually much better than I thought. That's repentance. Mm -hmm. We are flipping. I changed my mind about me. I'm a wreck. I changed my mind about him. And you know what he says? Well, then I'll change my mind about you. God repents. Mm -hmm. When you repent, who mm -hmm. else repents? God repents. He says, I'll change my mind about you then. Now you're mine. Mm -hmm. That's what we've got to get back to. And the good man paid a debt. And you can, you can go and know that by the precious blood of Jesus shed for you, that there is a rightness and you can be transformed from bad to good. Right? It's, this is all the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what it is. That's the result of the outworking of the true gospel getting preached. We were never told to go out and preach the love of Jesus. We can talk about the love of Jesus ourselves. We're believers. We know how precious it is. We will treat it very gently. We will be very careful with that love because we know the cost. But we're not going to throw pearls before swine. We're going to do the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? Do you understand? Yes. That's what the Holy Spirit came to do. Let's pray.